Let's turn in our Bibles in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. We read from verse 10 to verse 13, and also verse 18. Ephesians, chapter 6. We read from verse 10 to verse 13. And the title of this message is, We Do Not Wrestle Against Flesh and Blood. Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10 to 13, and also verse 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. And verse 18 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So let's close our eyes and pray. We thank you, Lord, for your weight. We thank you that it is a weight that is sufficient for all times and is also sufficient for us in these days and times that we live in. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you may speak to us as your children, that we may be able, O oh Lord, to know this which you are trying to communicate with us this morning. So be with us, O oh Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, brethren, the greatest mistake that we as Christians could make is to assume that salvation means that all our troubles in this world have disappeared. And because we are now saved, then we get to live a life of bliss, a life of good times, a life filled with all the pleasures of this world. And if ever there is a position that the devil wants to find the Christians in is a position where Christians think they have made it. That they have conquered this whole world already. That there is no trouble that will come upon them and then they go on to live a life full of comfort. Because they are assuming that no trouble will come upon them in this world. So then we find Christians, many Christians, finding themselves in a comfort zone where everything is all nice, where there is no battle, there is no striving for anything. And all they think they have to do is to enjoy life, to avoid to sin as much as possible while waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And such thinking is the reason why the health and wealth prosperity message has managed to sneak in into the church. Because the people's minds are already accustomed to thinking that they are to enjoy this life as much as possible because they are now Christians. That they can relax because all the good things are coming to them in this world. But here in our text, Paul is saying something that is totally different from what many people consider the Christian life to be these days. You see, when you go through this book of Ephesians, from, verse, from chapter 1 to chapter 3, Paul is telling us of the things that God has done for us. He leads them. The spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. The assurance of our salvation. The fact that we are now one in Christ, regardless of our race. 
And he mentions also the spiritual strength that God provides for us. From chapter 4, he starts to tell us of the things that we must do. He starts to tell us that we must walk in the newness of life. That we must be people of love who don't walk in righteousness. And he deals with the husbands, he deals with the wives and the children. How they must behave. How children should obey their parents. How we should act or how we should be in our workplaces, around our bosses. And here in, in our text, he adds one other thing that we need to do as Christians. He adds another imperative to the long list of imperatives that he has already mentioned. So in our text then, brethren, Paul makes three appeals to Christians, to the church of Ephesians, to us as well as the church of Vienna Park. And the first appeal he says is that be aware that you are in a war. And the second one is that be aware that your enemy is fierce. And the third one is that be aware that you must fight. So in the first place then, brethren, we see that Paul compares us to Greek soldiers. He brings this picture of a Greek soldier. And he's doing this to bring an awareness to us that we are not on holiday on this earth. That we were not saved to have a good time on this earth while we are waiting for Christ to come. He says in verse 12, we are wrestling. He's using this negative of saying we are not wrestling, but on the positive he's actually saying we are wrestling. So he's bringing this warning to us that we are not safe to relax and enjoy our lives. Rather, the moment we are saved, we found ourselves in the middle of this spiritual war. And Paul likens this spiritual war to a wrestling match. That there, there, there are clear rules in this war. It is a war unto death. The devil is trying to make a shipwreck of our faith. He wants to destroy us. It is a war that has been raging for ages. And it is a war not only for our own souls, but for the souls of other men whom Christ will call. Because here's the thing. We desire to remain in the love of Christ. We want to continue in this Christian faith which we have been called in. And we want others as well to come to the knowledge of the same Christ which we have come unto the knowledge of. But Satan tries not only to destroy our faith, but to keep people in spiritual darkness. So one mistake we can never do is to be fooled into thinking that we are not in this war just because we do not feel like we are in this war. Or just because we do not see it with our own eyes, then we start to thinking that there is no spiritual war that Paul is talking about. Because that would be a mistake, because our ignorance of this war does not make it less real. It is there. And the fact that we do not see it, it does not mean that if you are just relaxed, then this war will just not be there. And the war continues to be fierce. It continues to rage. And another mistake we can make as reformed people is to say God is sovereign. And then after we say God is sovereign, then we think that that absolves us from our responsibility to engage in this war. So we repeat them over and over again, God is sovereign. And then we fold our arms and do nothing to engage in this spiritual war. And then we think it will be war. Because of what we believe. Because, brethren, 
The same Apostle Paul, who preached on the sovereignty of God, is the same one who tells us that Christians are engaged in the spiritual war for their lives. That the two go hand in hand together. That God is sovereign and because of that we find ourselves in this spiritual war and we must fight. I mentioned that this is a war for us to remain in the faith. Because the devil tries to tempt us, tries to make a shipwreck of our faith. But it is also a war for those who do not know Christ that they may come in. Just open in the book of Acts 28, verse 16 to 18, and see of how Paul described his mission. His preaching ministry, book of Acts 28, verse 16 to verse 18. He says here, giving a testimony of what Christ had said to him, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you. To do what? Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So here Paul is describing his mission on this earth. He says, Christ says, you have to be delivered from your enemies, from the devil. And then second, that he needs to bring the gospel to others so that they also may be delivered from the devil. So in this spiritual world, then, we see that there are two opposing enemies. There are two sides. There is this one side that wants to keep people in spiritual darkness. Its mission is to make sure that things remain as they are. People continue to be in darkness. Its mission is to make sure that any efforts to shine the light of the gospel is destroyed, is extinguished. That people remain in spiritual darkness. And finally, to make sure that those who have seen their light they have been tempted to that day before. So we see that here. Our text tells us that this is not a friendly match. You know, in a boxing match, when they start, they bump fists to show that there is no bad blood between the two. It's just a sport. But here, there is no mercy to be shown to the other side. The mission of the first side, this side of the devil is clear. It must shut the gospel up. And if it is not able to shut the gospel up, then kill those who are preaching the gospel. That is the way that this side of the devil works. Make sure that the gospel is not preached. If those who preach it continue to preach it, then kill them. In both ways, you will still achieve the same thing, shutting the gospel down. And then we have this other side. This is our side. First of all, we have been rescued from the power of Satan. Paul says so in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He says there, he, meaning God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we see that because we have been delivered from the domain of Satan, from the domain of darkness, we now have a mission for those who are still in that domain to be rescued. We were there, we know how it is, but God has rescued us. And our mission is now that others may, may also be rescued, 
the same way that we may be rescued. And because of that, we fight towards that mission. Because we want the light of the gospel to shine everywhere so that those who are sitting in darkness may see the light. And because of that, we have to be determined to pay with our own lives so that the gospel can be preached and believed. We have to put our lives, our own lives on the line so that the lives of others may be rescued from this domain of darkness that Paul is talking about. Because this war will cost us everything. That is why when Jesus called his disciples, he said, they must count the cost. Because he knew that they will face opposition, opposition that will cost them even their very life. So as I mentioned, we are not only fighting for others to be saved, we are fighting for ourselves not to fall into the temptations of the devil. We are fighting for our own perseverance. We believe it that God will enable us to persevere, but we have to persevere. We're fighting for endurance, to continue in this mission that we are in, because it is easy to be discouraged, to say, let's just leave it. It is not working. Even though we believe that God, Christ, will build his church, but we still face the discouragement. And every day we fight against our flesh that continues to battle within us, causing us to sin against God, causing us to be people who are not living according to the gospel. And we're fighting for the purposes of God in our lives to be fulfilled, that indeed God may achieve that which he has set out to achieve for us individually and as a church, that his purpose indeed may bear fruit in our lives. The Apostle Paul is not the only one who was concerned to make sure that the church is aware of this spiritual battle. Apostle Peter emphasized the same thing. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Apostle Peter, you know that we go going through the sermon series in the book of Peter. You know that he is writing to Christians, those elect of God who are dispersed all over the world. And he says to them in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be sober-minded. He says, have the right thinking. Don't have the wrong thinking about what you are and what situation you find yourself in. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful, be aware. There is danger around you, be aware. He says, your adversary, your enemy, the devil, falls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Right into Christians says there is danger around you. The devil is in a war against you. So you must be watchful, you must be sober-minded. So the second thing we see here, friend, is that our enemy is fierce. So we see here that we are not in a fictional world, some war that we think is just in our minds. And the war is real. And we are not in a war against mere earthly people. Rather, it is a war against the worst enemy we can think of. Look at verse 12 of our text. It says that, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If 
we have done a bit of English at school, you will know that there's a reason why Paul keeps repeating against, against. He does not say against flesh and blood, comma, against the rulers, comma, against the authorities, comma, against the cosmic powers. Instead, he adds against to emphasize just how fierce our opponent is, our enemy is. So, brethren, our war is not against the people who vandalized our place in Oliver. No. Our war is against spirits which are powerful than anything we could ever imagine. And these spirits are working in the lives of people to achieve certain purposes. People may appear to be the ones who are doing certain things, but behind them, there are spirits working, having a certain agenda to defeat you, to shut the gospel up. Then they go and work within people to achieve these certain things. So what did we see in the world event? We see people vandalizing. But what is it we do not see? There are spirits behind that. Spirits who have made it their mission to oppose the preaching of the gospel. <clears throat> they don't have flesh, they don't have blood, they are not humans. Yet they exist and they are powerful. And they are able to manipulate people and manipulate situations to achieve the purpose of shutting the gospel up. And unlike you and me, they don't feel like they want to rest on Saturday or Sunday morning. They are always ready to fight. They don't get tired of waging war against us as Christians. So some of you may be sitting there thinking that since we left Oliver, that all now is good and well. That the problem was Oliver. And those people, they, they were the ones who were problem. That now we are in Virta Park, and then all our troubles are disappearing. No. The same spirits that work there are the same spirits that exist even here. They may not manifest themselves in the same way, but they will fight in the same way. The purpose is still the same. Shut down the church of God. Ensure that there is no gospel that is being preached. And this war continues to rage. And the enemy is fierce. And if we are going to sleep on the job, then the enemy will strike. That is the warning that Paul is trying to bring to us. That the enemy has certain rulership. He has authority. He has certain powers over this world that is full of darkness. That the enemy is a force of evil. And not only that, he does things from a heavenly place. And Paul says our enemy is well organized. He rules over kingdoms of darkness. He has authority and he knows how to use this authority. And he has people to do his dirty work for him. Although he is placed under the restrictions of God, but he has leeway to work. He has leeway to be able to trouble us. And that will continue as long as we live in this world. So his mission is clear then, to fill the earth with as much evil as possible. We have an opposite mission, to fill the earth with the glory of God. And his mission is different, fill the earth with evil. So what's going to happen? There's going to be a collusion. We want the earth to be filled with the glory of God. He wants the earth to be filled with evil. There's a collusion. And he holds grudges. He does not forgive. And he will make sure that those who oppose him pay.
pay for it. Brethren, our enemy plots against our downfall. He does not rest. He's forever looking for ways to bring us down. At any given moment, he has a plan for us individually and us collectively as a church. A plan on how he may cause us to fall. Through his agents, these demons, he has studied us. He has studied you. He has studied your life. He has come up with a plan. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strength. And he devises a plan based on these things. How can I trap this person to fall? How can I destroy this church? And he has studied to this church. He has studied his leaders. He has studied the strength, the weaknesses. He knows everything there is to know about them. He knows everything there is to know about you. And he, if he cannot destroy you directly, he will try to use your children to get to you. He will try to destroy your children. And if he cannot succeed there, he will try to destroy your finances. That you may not give to the church. That the work of the church may be not going forward. Thank you, Teresa. Now, does God use it also to bring water? <laughs> because He is the enemy that plots against us and desire to ensure that the work of the gospel is shut down. And there is one thing that he targets more than any other, which happens to be a weakness in most sound churches. He targets the prayer life of the church. Because he knows that if he can shut down the prayer life of a church, if a church is not a praying church, then he will have accomplished a lot. So he comes with plans to ensure that the church does not pray. So brethren, as I've mentioned, our enemy is well accomplished. And he has many victories under his belt. He's a great champion in the soul destruction business. He has destroyed the souls of many. He has ruined many souls and he continues to do so even today. You know that there are many people who have stand in front of us and confessed Christ and say I am saved. We don't know where they are. Disappeared. And we know they are not in some sound Bible preaching church somewhere. We know they are not. And in the Bible, we have very good examples. Judas Iscariot, a man who cast out demons. Huh? Man who cast out demons made a shipwreck of his faith. And Apostle Paul talks of his very good friend, Demas, a man who went around preaching with the Apostle Paul. His faith shipwrecked, destroyed. And many local churches have been ruined by our enemy. I was just thinking this morning that he writes this letter to the church of Ephesians. I was just thinking, can we trace the church that exists today that come directly from this church of Ephesians? And I'm thinking to my mind, we probably could not. The same church destroyed, local church destroyed. And we ourselves, we have a blue eye. You know, when we have been in a war with a person, in a fight, we have a blue eye. You know that we got beaten really good. 
we are a church with a blue eye in Oliver because of this our anniversary, this adversary of ours. So the first thing that Paul wants to bring to the attention of the Ephesians back then is that they must fight. They are in this fierce spiritual war, but they must fight. And I just mentioned just how fierce our enemy is, how powerful he is, how he is able to work out the circumstances and the people to bring them to do his purpose. So you might be sitting there discouraged, but brethren, there is hope. Why do I say there is hope? Turn your Bible in the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 and see why there is hope. Why Paul says the things that he says. He says it in Colossians 2 verse 15, He, meaning Jesus Christ, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So the same Paul says, yes, the devil is powerful. Yes, he has all this authority. Yes, he's fierce. But Jesus Christ has defeated Satan on the cross. He said he put him to open shame. So this great champion who destroys the souls of many great men and women, this strong man, Satan, meets a stronger man, a greater champion than him, Jesus Christ, and he lost. And because Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross, this is why we have verse 10 of our text. This is why Apostle Paul can say in verse 10 of our text, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Notice here that the Apostle Paul is not saying that we have some inner strength that we need to tap in, that we need to use to be strong, to be able to fight the devil. He says, no, be strong in the strength of the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He's saying we should not rely on ourselves in this spiritual war. Instead, there is one who is strong, the one who is might in strength. And the reliance here is that we must have the Lord as our source of hope. The Lord who is strong, the Lord who is mighty in strength, the Lord who is stronger than Satan. Because that is the idea here, that the Lord is strong. He has dealt with the devil. He is able to deal with him even today. That there is no plots of the devil that he can come up with, that our Lord will not be able to deal with him because he is able to fight on our behalf. Then Apostle Paul then continues in verse 11, and in verse 13, verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And verse 13, he says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. So Apostle Paul here, when he says, there is this armor of God. There is these tools, these weapons, these means of grace provided for us by our Lord Jesus Christ that we may use against this battle against the devil. This means of grace, these weapons. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to fight for us and he has given us tools to use to fight. The means of grace to use to fight. 
and Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he describes the power of these weapons. He says there, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, meaning they are not weak, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. He's saying, the mighty Christ who defeated Satan has given us these weapons, these means of grace. And these means of grace are not fleshy, are not things that are just weak, but they are things which are powerful to have divine power to fight in a world that we do not see. Because we fight against the enemy that we do not see before our eyes. And these weapons are able to fight at that level and destroy these strongholds. So we are not fighting a losing battle. Instead, we have in our disposal weapons that are powerful enough to destroy the kingdom of the devil. So we're not going to get into those weapons or the armor of the Lord in verse 14 to 17. But they are mentioned there. Truth is one of them. Righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the way of God. <coughs> and these are the tools that Apostle Paul says they are being given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to fight when faced with temptation when faced with stubborn places like Oliver, we use this. My interest is in verse 18. Because in verse 18, there is something that stands above all of them that the Apostle Paul mentions. You see here, I mentioned that Apostle Paul here uses a picture of a Greek soldier. A soldier in the days of Apostle Paul. He will put on all these things. He will put on this belt, this breastplate. He will put on fighting shoes. He will put on a shield, a helmet, a sword. But this soldier, after putting on this armor, he just does not go to war. There's an assembly. They come, stand in the line, in formations. And in those days, they will pray to their gods. Why? Because they know that their opponents are going to come wearing the same armor. So the armor is not what's going to win them the war. So they pray to their gods that indeed their gods may plead for them in this war. That these prayers that they are making may tilt the war in their favor. So, brother, this is important because I know you are the people who love the proof of God and walk in righteousness and you love the gospel and you walk in faith that the word of God is preached in power every Sunday in this place. But in verse 18, Paul says, Having put on the armor of God, there is one more important matter to be done as part of engaging in this war. He says there in verse 18, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. This prayer, he is not listing it as part of the armor of God. He lists it separately to show its importance, to show its necessity, to show that if we are indeed to successfully resist the devil that he may flee from us, then prayer must be our foundation as the people of God. He shows that it is important to do all these things. It's important to preach the gospel, to walk in faith, to have the love of the gospel. But we are to be rooted in prayer, in prayer. Because if we are not, 
then we are lacking in power. So this is the picture that Apostle Paul uses. That prayer will tilt the war in our favor. Because of this fact, then we must pray and pray at all times without ceasing. That we must not just pray, but pray without giving up. That we must pray without being modest. You must not be shy in prayer. Be ambitious to ask God. And here, the implication is that we must be desperate in prayer to God. Desperate. Realize that if God does not answer our prayer, we will lose. He must come through for us in prayer. Because when all else is said and done, prayer is the foundation in this war we are engaging in with the devil. Prayer is the engine that drives any church. Unless prayer is taken seriously, then we will never be successful in all our endeavors. There is a man I love called Leonard Ravenhill. Whenever he preach, there is always something he will say. He will say, no church will rise higher than his prayer life. No church will rise higher than his prayer life. And he will say, no man, regardless of how good he is in preaching, will rise higher than his prayer life. And that is the picture we see. That's the reality we see in the book of Acts with that local church of Jerusalem. They rose higher as they prayed. Let's see examples there. Acts chapter 1 verse 14. We read there that all this with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer to God together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. That's before Pentecost. And Pentecost happened. After Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We know that the church was successful. Many people were being added, were being saved in a very hostile environment that's even more hostile than anything we have ever witnessed. The devil really gave them a tough time. In Acts chapter 4, verse 24, we read that they lifted their voices together to God. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, it says, they made this vow, the elders of the church, that we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And when the leader of the church, the one who just made this vow on behalf of his elders, was arrested, the church in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, he says there, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Many were gathered together and were praying. So we read this book of Acts and we are impressed. But why were they successful? Because they were rooted in prayer. And the devil has never fought a local church like he fought that local church in Jerusalem. But they were people who were rooted in prayer. So we are a very ambitious church. We have great dreams that we want to achieve. Look at what God did 
in the church of Antioch in Acts chapter 13 verse 2. It says that while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, then God said, set apart Saul and Barabbas. And the gospel was preached in the Gentile cities. And many churches were planted. So brethren, this is to emphasize that this spiritual war requires us to be men and women of I am emphasizing prayer because I know that these are the things we are faithful in. But I doubt we could ever say that we are faithful in prayer. It is not just our problem. It's a problem in most Reformed Baptist churches. And that is why I said it's the first thing that the devil attacks. He attacks the prayer meeting. The prayer life of the church start to suffer. So brethren, we announced them during the announcement that we'll be engaged in, in a week of fasting and prayer. And on Saturday, we'll be going out to evangelize. Now, when the church is not strong in this point of prayer, God calls it to fasting and pray. To fast and pray. When the church is, is not what it feels it should be. In the eyes of the Lord, a church must fast and pray. Then in the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 15, verse 17, we see there, a church, as it were, people of Israel, who were somehow backsliding, God speaks to them, and he gives them what they should do. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. So when you stop there, God says, call everyone. This is not time to be having weddings and be merry, eating and drinking and be merry. Let the bridegroom and the bride leave their weddings and come and fast and pray. Then he says in verse 17, Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nation. Why should they say amongst the people, Where is the God? So the elders must lead by example. They must be the ones who cry out, then the church will fall. And say, spare your people, O Lord. Your name is at stake. Why should we, we be made a byword among the nation? Why should people mock and say that God doesn't exist? So when the church is not what it should be, then God calls on the elders of the church to call everyone, every member, and say we must fast and pray. And elders of the church must lead by example, by fasting and praying, and say to God, spare your people. So if we, as the elders of the church, we will not be faithful to call you to fast and pray. Then we are not be faithful in our duty. It's the relation of duty. We see that we are not doing that which we should be doing. And we sit by and do nothing. So we are asking you then, 
This week, we must fight. We must have an awareness that indeed we are in a spiritual war. A fierce war. Our enemy is fierce. But that we must call unto God and say, God, spare your church. Otherwise the enemy will sneak in. And while we least expect it, he will strike. As perhaps he has done before in body. So brethren, in closing, we mentioned that we are asking you, to engage in this fasting and prayer for the whole week. And basically, we are asking you to fight the good fight of the faith. To engage. To understand that indeed this is a spiritual fight. There is spirits working against the work we are trying to do. There is spirit keeping people captive so that they may not come and hear the gospel being preached. I think it's three weeks ago. I was with our pastor outside, and there's a lady who just called him and said, I'm coming to church. And then a car parks just in the street. And then people discuss, and they discuss, and they discuss, and the car passes. I said to him, There's your lady, she's leaving. She was determined to come to church here. Yeah. She heard our sermons, she saw our website, and she said, I'm coming here. But whatever happened, we don't know. She decided to leave and she has never came back. Because there are spirits waking, trying to keep people away from the gospel. So what do we pray then in this week? What are we saying? We say to God, why don't we see new conversions in this church of ours? Why? Why don't we see people coming to faith? Show us something that we are doing wrong. And we say to him, why are those people who stood in front of us? And some of them we took to the river to be baptized. Where are they? Did we do something wrong to them? What happened? Bring them back, O oh Lord. If we have trespassed against them, forgive us. Help them to be able to get over these things. Then we say to God, we want you to manifest yourself amongst us. May your presence be with us. So basically, we try to make a prayer that was made by Prophet Isaiah. You must read Isaiah chapter 62 to chapter 64. Isaiah prays to God. And in chapter 64, he says, Oh, that you may rent the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. He's looking back in Exodus 20, when God bent the heavens and came down on Mount Sinai, and the mountain quaked, and the nations far away, they felt that there is a God among the Israelites. We ask him for the same presence, that indeed God may rent the heavens and come and dwell amongst us. That people may know that there is God amongst us. So let us be faithful then, brethren, as we'll be starting with our week of fasting and prayer tomorrow, that indeed God may achieve these things amongst us. Let's close our eyes and pray. O oh Lord, our Savior,